What's up, everybody? It's Ulysses Owens Jr., and I'm so excited to be here with you uh, for the Open Studio show, uh, The Drummer's Perspective. So thank you all for joining me. Uh, it's been now, I think, about, what, four or five episodes? And uh, for those that tuned in last week with Peter Erskine, we had a great time, and he's such a wealth of knowledge. But I just want to thank everybody for, again, all the kind messages. For those that maybe this is your first one, uh, it's very much like family you know, time. We're all here together, and we're having a chance to chat with some incredible musicians and artists and, and uh, really industry veterans in many ways. So uh, thank you for those that tuned in with Peter Erskine and then before that, we had Ari Honig, and we've had Lewis Nash and Hurley Riley. So uh, we've got a great lineup for you going forward. And uh, also for those that are interested, uh, Open Studio Network is an incredible resource. Excuse me, Open Studio. They get on me all the time. Sorry, Open Studio is an incredible resource for any musician or anyone who's aspiring to become a musician or a jazz musician and learn from all of their various courses. I am fortunate to have uh, actually three courses. I was getting ready to say two because I just filmed one a couple weeks ago and uh, I'm really happy about those. One is with Ruben Rogers, another is my own course. So please check those out amongst the other great material. But today I'm just um, really thrilled because I feel like all the other players that I've had, uh, like Lewis and Herlin, um, other than Ari, even Peter, they were pretty much like teachers to me. Um, Nate is, is definitely not a peer. Um, he's definitely someone that has got, got to this much sooner than I did. Um, but I did not necessarily have a chance to have him as a teacher, but he is someone that I consider a supporter and someone that I've learned a great deal from. Um, and I plan to talk and share even some stories about that. But anyway, he's an incredible artist and drummer. He's also someone to me, and I, I wrote this on my Instagram post for those that follow me on Instagram. He is one of the most versatile musicians. And it's so interesting uh, because I saw his journey. Like I remember coming to New York, which I'll talk a little bit about with him. And uh, he always was this great drummer. And then all of a sudden, I feel like in the last four to five years, he's ascended to the point that we all knew he deserved to be at, which was everybody just just loving him and giving him the dap um, that, that he has earned as a drummer. Uh, he's one of my favorite drummers as a groover, one of my favorite tipping drummers. And what I love the most about him, he's considered now as this modern um, and, you know, innovator, but he understands and knows the tradition. So uh, I'm happy to talk to a friend, a supporter, and one of the greatest drummers living on the planet today. I want to welcome the great Mr. Nate Smith. Hey, hey, <laughs> come on, man. How much I owe you, you for up. that? Come on, how, how much I owe you for that intro, bro? Oh, no, man. It, you know, it's all love, baby. It's all Thank love. Thank you, brother. Man, it's good to see you, man. Good it's to good you. to see you, dog. You know, good it's, to see it's, you. You know, it's been a wild year. So, it's... man, whenever I see, you know, cats um, doing their thing, which yeah. I've been watching you, you know, do. Um, and I, it's, it's just great, man. So it's, thank, you. And thank you for having me. No, it's my honor. You know, I, I always knew about you, um, but I, I, you know, I'm all about being incredibly transparent. I think when I got a chance to really know you was when obviously you started working with Jose before. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I always tell people I, I love exposing my mistakes so other people can learn. And you were called in to handle some stuff because at, at the time I was too busy, had a lot going on. Yeah. And you came in, man, and you you just took over that gig. And that was when, when I really started understanding not just how talented you were, but just your ability to say, hey, I know you've got 50 more things going on than I do, um, but you were able to really hone in. And to me, you elevated a lot of what um, Jose is doing. Or I think you guys are still working together. Some, no, we, right? have, we haven't worked oh, together. He's got, he's got a new band now. Oh, okay, cool, stuff. cool. Yeah, yeah, so so I, I'm going to deal with your beginning, but I actually want to start kind of with that point was, you know, how do you manage, Nate? You know, I'm, I'm looking, obviously, I follow you on Instagram. You got all these, you know, followers. You're doing great things. But how do you manage all of these wonderful projects because everybody wants you so mm. how do you balance you know the musical integrity uh you know being the guy that everybody wants but also making sure that you show up and you handle your business and you do what the gig calls for oh man um you know the the thing i learned early on is you know you you take each and every gig if you say yes mm -hmm. you take it a hundred percent serious mm -hmm. you know you you play it like you know, whether you're playing in a, a jazz club with 100 people mm. or you're playing in a, an arena with mm. 15,000 people, yeah. you're playing as if it's your last gig. You're playing as if, you know, this is the gig that everyone in the world is going to see, yeah. you know? 
um, and really put yourself on the hook too. Mm. Like learn the music, um, you know, dive in as mm. this is the thing that I, I really um, appreciated about my time working with Dave Holland, you know, mm. um, and we can talk about Dave. Yeah, you know, of course. I, I can yeah. talk about Dave all day. But, uh, <laughs> one of the things I, you know, when, when it came time for me to make my first band leader record, um, I called Dave to, to play on it, you know, and Dave, the consummate professional, um, he wrote his own chart. What? He list, I had charts ready for him. He wrote his own chart, wrote it out. I said, yeah, man, I, you know, I wanted to sort of rewrite the part so that I could be <laughs> easier for me to read. And, you know, some, and, you know, knowing his instrument better than me, yeah. he, he, he spread out his chart. He had been listening to the, I sent this little demo. He had been listening to the demo, like for, you know, the whole couple days I sent it. Yeah. So he was so ready, you know, Wow. and that, and he's Dave Holland. Right, right. NEA jazz master, 40 right. year veteran, you know. Right. Um, so showing up to play on my record, he could have easily coasted in, okay, what's the thing? Okay, here's the mm. thing. All right, yeah, you know, roll it, give me two takes, and that would have right. been it. Right, right. But the fact that he took it so seriously, um, that that really made an impression on me, man. It really did. And it was just mm. like, and it was something I had been aspiring to do mm. for, for, you know, my career up to that point. Right. But seeing him do it, man, it really kind of drove it home you know take it yeah. all seriously you know no, i love it, that man it's oh, sorry. all serious yeah it's all yeah serious. and i think that was kind of you know one of the biggest lessons i had to learn because you know when you know it's one thing when you're when you're the sub guy right and you're just taking all the gigs it's another mm -hmm. thing when people start calling you and then you know you get happy about that right and then yeah. you get happy about being in demand but never losing that never losing that integrity musically mm -hmm. to say hey yes i'm busy people love what i do but everybody deserves my best yes. um I, I wanted to kind of shift you talked about dave holland and you know when i moved to new york back in 01 to me, that was what you were known for, Nate. Like, you were known for being this guy that could play all these amazing time signatures. Um, Sam, can you bring up the picture? We got we got a picture, I think, with you uh, playing uh -oh. with Dave. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> like boy. That, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Like, that, that, that's oh. the Nate Smith I remember, you know. Wow. And, you know, and, and so coming to New York, knowing <laughs> you as this guy yeah. that could play all these time signatures, and then all of a sudden, like, you like this groove guy. So like, can you maybe tell me a little bit about, I know you met Dave while you were in college at Virginia, mm -hmm. but just that transition playing with him, what he taught you. And then all of a sudden, like now you're this like funk guy. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. this cat is a tipper. So like, you know, any, any, any of that journey you want to, you want to enlighten us about, man, man, it's, you know, like I said, this, you're going to have to shut me up. Cause I can, Please. I can go, I, I can go on and on. <laughs> okay. Um, but you know, the, the beautiful thing about playing with Dave, um, Dave, when I came into the, the band, um, so let me back up. 1997, okay. I met him. He was okay. an artist in residence at Virginia Commonwealth University. And uh, he came, he, he brought his big band book. We did a small group concert with him. And it was mm -hmm. like, and honestly, man, if I'm keeping 100% 100, 100 yeah. real, I didn't know that much about Dave. Say, I yeah. knew his playing <laughs> from um, the Herbie Hancock New Standard album. That was the album that I was like, you know, buried in at the time. But knowing his own work, um, you know, his work with Sam Rivers, his work mm -hmm. with Chick, his work with Miles, mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that much about it. So when I found out he was coming, I dove in. I started listening to all his stuff, you know. And at the time, this is 1997, um, this is like the quintet, the sort of legendary quintet mm -hmm. had just kind of started. So I think at that point, Gene Jackson was playing with him. Whoa. Yeah. Um, he had a record with Gene Jackson. And then... The second quintet record, I think, is when Billy Kilson joined. Okay. Right? So I meet Dave. He comes to school. It's a, we, we have a hookup. It's great. He's very kind and very encouraging. Um, and so he says, I'm going to call you. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, I didn't, I didn't oh, believe him. Yeah. But he said, I'm going to call you. And so he called me to sub. Actually, before I joined the band, he called me to sub for Billy twice. In um, 99 and 2000, I did one gig um, each of those years with Dave. And just dove into the deep end, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I loved about playing with Dave is that at no point did Dave ever say to me, and I'm coming in after Billy Kilson, one of the greatest mm, drummers, of course, ever recorded. Yeah, you know, and not only a great drummer, a huge part of that band sound. The reason mm -hmm. that band sounds like that, right, is partially because of Billy. Right, you know, right. So I'm coming in after Billy, and Dave never said to me, "Do it like Billy." He never said, you know, play it like Billy. 
play, you know, Billy used to do this. Yeah. So why don't you do this? He never did that. He was like, yo, man, I want you to play your thing. Yeah. I want you to play, approach the music your way. Mm -hmm. um, and that music, there's so much information in that music, you know, mm -hmm. with Robin Eubanks in the band and Chris Potter in the band and Steve Nelson Oof. in the band, they all bring so much, so many influences to the music. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to shout out Robin Eubanks because Robin was the guy who brought the funk sort of backbeat ideas that language into the group. Really? You know, if you listen to some of those records, man, um, Prime Directive, okay. um, Juggler's Parade, which I play with my band now, right. um, you know, some, and particularly Robin, Robin's tunes, uh, Metamorphose, you know, these, these records, Full mm -hmm. Circle, these, 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 these compositions he brought in, there's all this mixed language in it. Okay. You know, sometimes we're sing swinging, sometimes we're playing funk language. Mm -hmm. um, so it was always all in there. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason Dave liked me in the band was because I could switch those hats. You know, I could go from playing straight ahead time to playing a groove thing and the music still felt like the momentum was was happening and you nate know? real quick where did that start because I, I that's a big part of his, this interview as well like where did like where was the group like you learned how to groove authentically and then the swing like how did that how did you develop that for a dave holland yeah man you know that goes back that goes way back that goes okay. back to, to my pop's record collection you know because wow. my pop's record collection was mostly instrumental r b like soul jazz from the late 70s, early 80s, right? Okay. So it was Grover and Sanborn and Jazz Crusaders, you know, and it was all those drummers, Steve Gadd, mm -hmm. you know, Sticks Hooper, you know, wow. um, and and Harvey Mason, you know. Yeah. Those were the guys that I kind of grew up, Idris Muhammad. Ooh, those were the yeah. guys I grew up listening to on yeah. record and, and trying to cop, you know. Um, then when I got into like my teenage years, when I really decided to pursue music for real, mm -hmm. um, there were two cataclysmic events. Mm -hmm. The first was um, this documentary about Sting called Bring on the Night. Came oh, out I heard about it. Yeah. Remember yeah. this band? Yeah. This, it, was, it was right after he left the police and um, the band was uh, Branford Marsalis, Kenny Kirkland, mm -hmm. Daryl Jones, and Omar Hakim on drums. Wow. So watching those guys, and I had, I knew all of Sting's music from the police and all that stuff I had absorbed, but watching them play it, mm. um, it just, it blew my mind. The way that they opened up the, 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 the songs, the way that they um, would like open up the, these improvisatory sections and like reharmonize this stuff. It was mm. just incredible. I had never heard anything like it, you know? Wow. So I imitated all of that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I imitated. Wow. I, I learned every note of that wow. movie. I learned every note Omar played. Um, the second event was this, uh, these four black gentlemen uh, from New York City, a rock band called Living Color. That was the Whoa, next Oh, Will Calhoun. Will wow. Calhoun. Shout out that's to a, Will Calhoun. That, that's groid. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you know what's funny? You know what's really funny, man? And this is something that I didn't, Put together until much later but you know will made a whole album in dedication to elvin with christian and he, it's a project that just came out in the last couple years whoa i gotta check that out it's it's a beautiful record and you know if you really listen to will's playing with living color in the those first few records i mean his his entire discography with them but particularly their live playing from like the early the mid 80s when their records came out you hear so much Elvin in his playing. Wow. You hear like these waves of sound that are coming from the drum kit and the way he pushes and pulls the time. Mm -hmm. Wow. Man, it's it's something that I couldn't really put together at the time. I didn't okay. realize what it was I loved about his playing. Okay. Wow. But once I learned that, it's like, oh, of course. Wow. This, of course. Wow. You know? Wow. Um, and then on the on the flip side of that, Vernon Reed. One of his first sideman gigs was with, was with the great Ronald Shannon Jackson. You know, I'm not hip. I'm not hip. And Ronald Shannon Jackson, one of the kind of unsung, uh, I, I believe, Texas drummers. Right? He's like he played with Cecil Taylor. He played with Albert wow. Eiler. Okay. Kind of a free cat, but okay. but Groy, but comp I mean, so 
deep, mm -hmm. such a deep well. And I'm still learning about Shannon. You know, wow. I'm still learning about him. And so many of the musicians that I have met and worked with in New York, particularly Adam Rogers, Fema Efron, mm. they were working with Shannon in the 90s. Wow. You know, um, and so, you know, I didn't realize all of these links that this music had okay. to jazz. Wow. But it had it and it was okay. buried in there somewhere in the DNA it was in there. So that's I mean, if you know, a long, very long answer to this sort of amalgam of like jazz and funk or jazz and rock or jazz okay. and groove language that developed way before I met Dave. Cool. So we so we talk about Dave, which is sort of like the middle of the alphabet for you. Yeah. Let's go back to sort of, you know, B and C and let's talk. Well, how apropos. Let's talk about Betty Carter. Let's talk about it. Man. <laughs> and, let's talk and, about and, it. And, while, and when we talk about her um, before, because I know you're going to go on, on, on a little tangent. I, we have to yes. talk about the great Ralph Peterson. Yes. Who um, can we pull up that picture? Um, you told this gorgeous story on Instagram. Oh, man. Um, and, and which leads to, you know, your formal uh sort of lessons and, yes. and i just have to read a little bit of it and um, for those that don't follow nate please follow him on, him on instagram but he wrote this story um under this picture and he simply says he's mostly self-taught i uh, never had a long-standing relationship with a private drum instructor but uh any any of who he was basically he can you know attribute to just figuring it out mm -hmm. but basically ralph was in the audience saw him mm -hmm. noticed a deficiency in his technique and at the club gave him a lesson so yes. i'm just gonna leave you there where we talked about rp which god bless you and rest oh. your soul oh, and man. then also betty carter so in any entryway into to both of those artists oh man i you know you know my, my heart gets full when i talk yeah. about betty yeah um yeah. it really does man she's just so important to so many musicians mm -hmm. um but you know yeah, let me talk about Betty first because okay, Betty led great. me to Ralph. Great. So, um, 1995, I played at Disney World, and it was the the Disney Grammy All American College <laughs> Jazz Band. Too. That's a lot. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Disney World. <laughs> I mean, bro, we was out there in Tuxes, in Orlando heat. Woo! You know, I'm and in you, Florida. I know right. about that. And so we out there three shows, four shows a day. The okay. first show was at like one o'clock or okay. two o'clock so you know it was just all yeah yeah but in that band um that year was a great trombonist andre hayward what from yes from houston shout out right. to andre shout out to houston yeah. like you know and andre had just done betty carter's inaugural jazz ahead residency wow which was spring of 95 in brooklyn i believe that was her first one and, um, you know, we became really good friends. And he told me over the course of the summer, I'm going to recommend you to Betty for Jazz Ahead. And that recommend that recommendation changed my life. I met her about six months later um, in New York at the now defunct IAJE conference. Yep. Remember IAJE? Mm -hmm. um, I met her there and uh, she shook my hand. She, she came and saw me play. And my, my, my uh, college small group had a, had a show. And so she came and saw me play there. She shook my hand, you sound good, you sound good. <laughs> shook my hand, you know. And um, then about three or four weeks later, I got a call from Andre saying, hey, man, Betty wants you for Jazz Ahead this spring. And, man, when I tell you that Jazz Ahead in 1996 changed my life in so many fundamental ways, um, the number one, Betty Carter was the first musician of renown to, to see me play and say, you've got something special. You know, and for a kid from Chesapeake, Virginia, which is not and I love Chesapeake, but it's not a musical city. Right. You know? Right. It doesn't really have a scene. Um, that was a huge vote of confidence. That was just a huge boost of confidence. So for her to say, I like the way you play, I want you to come play with these other musicians, these other young musicians from all over the country. Man, that was big. And then. The other way it shook me up was because it was the first time that I had seen musicians my age mm -hmm. playing on that level, mm -hmm. you know, burning. So the first three, the first year that I did Jazz Ahead, there were three drummers. Um, Byron Landham, who. What? Yes. Who had the gig with Betty at the time. He was her drummer. Man, she had every great drummer. Dog. She, I, bro, Byron, I had never met him before. Byron was tipping so hard i had never Whoa. heard anybody swing like that yeah the dynamics the language in his playing he knew so many records he would just talk about all these different records all these different you know and it was myself 
And then the third drummer was a young man from Houston, Texas, named Eric Harland. Jesus. <laughs> That's a that's the pile of drums, bruh. There's but no also way. three different personalities. Yes, absolutely. That that was the beauty of it was that she saw that too. She saw, obviously, she knew Byron's playing and she knew Eric's playing and she knew mine, and so she saw that we all brought something different wow. to the mix. And so the other thing that was great about Jazz Ahead was that you had to bring in your own tunes, mm -hmm. you know. So you bring in your you, you put your little band together, you bring in your tunes, you rehearse it. And at the end of the week, you play a concert with all your original music, you know. So not only are you meeting these incredible young musicians, but you're, you're getting to work with them in this really wow. immersive environment. Right. What a brilliant idea. You right, know? right, right. What a brilliant idea. And to this day, some of those musicians, um, you know, the, the year that I did it, uh, 96, and then I did the, the, the last year with her, unfortunately, she passed away that year, 98, was the, also the first year at the Kennedy Center. Wow. And okay. Yeah, that year the three drummers were um, myself, Eric Harlan, and Rodney Green. Whoa, man! <laughs> and and Rodney was just eating it alive, man. Wow. Rodney, ooh, Rodney was oh my gosh! Wow, you know? Nate, tell me real quick because I know you're going to talk about Ralph and a little more about Betty, but and you know because I had Eric on the show, what was it that Betty heard? that helped her to identify and shape great drummers because i mean you talk about lewis nash yes you hutch yeah. Yeah. so what like was you know did she ever talk about drums actively because it, I mean, it seems like if not for betty carter a lot of who we know mm. you know particularly in the last 25 30 years as great drummers in jazz we would not have them without betty carter without betty I, you know there was always this momentum that betty wanted the music to have mm. you know and this energy that she was looking for in the music because she brought that to the music. You know, Betty was so intense on mm. stage and she was so in charge, you know? Betty knew the form better than anyone on, the, on stage, no matter how she sang the form, she always knew where it was. Mm. She always knew where she was. She could stretch the form out, she could vamp stuff, she, could, she would stay on a turnaround for, mm. for you know, she would, you know, just take the form and, and just play with it, mold it, sculpt it, you know, mm -hmm. but she was completely in charge. And I think she, number one, at least my experience with her was that she knew she needed musicians who were listening all the time. Okay. Who were, you know, in tune with what was happening because okay. Betty could change it on a dime, Wow. you know? And so you had to really pay attention. The other thing she, she getting back to this idea of momentum and energy, mm -hmm. um, I remember at Jazz Ahead, she would always kind of hover over the different instruments. And she would like hover, hover over you. Like, you know, mm -hmm. okay, okay. And she would hover over the piano player and say, like, you know, no, you have to play. It's in wow. this CBS uh, uh, sun Sunday morning uh, expose that Billy Taylor did. God bless him. Okay. There's this thing where she's talking to the, the piano player and saying, no, you have to play staccato, 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 staccato. It helps you play fast. <laughs> She'd be hovering over him. You know, wow. like, no, you play staccato. That's how you play fast. Wow. <laughs> Man, yo, it was incredible. This, this, um, if she saw that you had that fire in you, mm -hmm. she would do everything she could to coax it out wow. of you on stage, you know? Wow. And that kind of, um, pursuit, um, in every moment, she was, she was always sort of pursuing the truth in the music, you know? Wow. And, uh, so I, I think, man, if, if if she heard anything in my playing or anyone else's playing, it was that, that same sort okay. of pursuit of the truth, energy in the okay. music. And and before we, you know, you talk about Ralph, can you mm -hmm. tell me, you know, you, you have this, you know, interesting upbringing in Chesapeake, you know, you do her, you know, you play at her camp, all that. How did you know just, you know, because I, I go in and out of obviously sort of metaphors and philosophy questions about the drums to just nerding out. Mm -hmm. How did you know what symbols to use for Betty? How did you oh. know, you know, how did you know, like gear wise, like especially, mm. you know, as you get ready to rap about Ralph, like how you said he helped you with the, the deficiencies and stuff or whatever you had technically. So like Betty kind of calls you like, how do you <laughs> like, oh. like, can you tell me a little like, like, let us drummers in on a little bit of like. Do, do you are you playing Vic Firth five A's? Are you like you know dragging an old raggedy symbol? Like what's that you know, bruh? Man, I learned so much about um, what symbols do to a band. Ooh. Um, I got I got to give a shout out to Billy Hart. Okay, who just we just found out yeah. NBA Jazz Master yeah. one time for Billy Hart Jabali. Yeah. 
the, the Oracle. Yes. Um, but but one thing that Billy said to me, this was this was after I started playing with Betty, but I thought about it. Um, he said, you know, symbols are not meant to sound good on their own. Symbols are meant to make the band sound good. Symbols are the Whoa. sheen on top of the music. Symbols are the icing, you know? So how do the symbols make the band sound? Right? <laughs> <laughs> hold on, you got you hold up, Nate. You gotta repeat, bro. You just come on. You just blew my cause you know Lewis Nash when I was studying with him and he would always talk about the ride symbol was your planet Earth. Yes. And then he said your other surrounding symbols are your other planets, and mm -hmm. they all have to be in tandem with each other. But mm -hmm. I've never heard man, man, can you just reiterate that again? Man, in in what in the music we play, you know, that kind of uses the ride symbol as a timekeeper, the sound of that symbol is gonna cut and wash over everything that's happening on stage. Wow. wow. You know? So this was the 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 mind-blowing revelation that Billy Hart gave me was <laughs> like, yo, man, the symbols are not just meant to sound good on their own. They're also meant to make the band sound good, you know? Bro, and, and you know, and I know that you have more students than than I do, and I always get these students, and this is no shade to dry symbols, right? But I always get these students that bring these dry symbols in, yep. or these beautiful symbols, and they've got tape on them, and I'm like, yo, like, like, it, does your pianist or can will they be able to feed off of that? So anyway, I, yeah, I don't want to interrupt you anymore, but that, Brother, thank you, thank you. Oh man, thank you, Billy, thank you, Billy. Wow. You know? Um. But also, man, I learned some of, some of the things I learned the hard way with Betty, too. I remember really? there was one symbol I had. It was a Sabian symbol. Um, and I think it was a, on the smaller side, like a 19, 20 inch that I was playing as a ride. And there was a note. There was a tone in it um, that, that the, the more I played it, the more you could hear this tone floating. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where she said, you know, this symbol, this symbol has a note in it that's that's kind of messing with me a little bit. I really never thought about that i never even thought about it bro i never even thought about that wow, wow. right she has it has, has a note in it that's kind of it's kind of like kind of messing with me a little bit you know so i played a different symbol a low a, a bigger symbol that had a sort of a lower tone that worked a little better for her you know um and i also learned man speaking of this because you are the master and congratulations on your book um but brushes wow so I got to tell you this story about Betty. Please, a brother. We were on stage at the Blue Note, um, and she was singing "Every Time We Say Goodbye," right? One of her signature wow. ballads. And it was uh, me, Bruce Flowers, Curtis Lundy, mm. and uh, J.D. Allen. Mm. Okay, and so the, she's playing it so slow. <laughs> And young, nervous drummer, I'm filling up all the space with all this stuff. I'm trying, I'm like filling it all up because I, I want to, you know, I'm, I don't know how to yeah. let the music live. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. So I'm filling it all up. So she gets, she walks over to me, gets off the mic and whispers oh. to me, it's too noisy. <laughs> right? 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 And hashtag. Hashtag it's too noisy. <laughs> right? Hashtag it's too noisy. So she says it, she whisper yells it so that the people in the front row no Nate totally heard her. <laughs> so I'm like sitting there like and so for the rest, so for the rest of the thing, I'm like I I don't move. I don't move. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, um, but man, you know, yeah. in terms of, of the sound of my instrument mm. in a band, um, brother, it, it, you know, that was some fundamental okay. education. Okay. And invaluable education okay. with wow. Betty, you know? It's amazing. Man. So now, great. so now, Ralph Peterson. Ralph Peterson. Um, so another adventure with Betty Carter. There was a, um, the Blue Note was celebrating, I think it's 15th anniversary in the, the West Third Blue Note mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. And um, big star studded event. Betty was playing there that week. Mm -hmm. And at the end of one of those nights, she opened it up for this jam session. And brother, when I tell you, this, this was one of those nights, man, that, you know, I can't even really believe I was there. But wow. so the band, she had her like jazz ahead band that she she would let us open for her 
Mm-hmm. So the band was uh, Aaron Goldberg, wow. uh, Greg Tardy, wow. Eric Revis, and myself. Okay. Okay. And so we're opening for Betty. Wow. And so during our opening set, Greg Tardy plays a chorus of a, of a tune, and he walks over to me. He leans over and he says, "Elvin just walked in." <laughs> like, like that's gonna help you out, right? <laughs> Brother, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. Greg, you knew what you was doing, man. <laughs> Brother, when and and I and I didn't want to look, but then I saw him. I wow. saw Elvin walk in. Wow! And this is ninety six, so this is you know Elvin is you know he's still in the game, man. Wow! He's, he yeah. looks great. He just comes. He's just glowing, mm-hmm. you know. And so I see him. He sits like right over. He sits right over my left shoulder, mm-hmm. and <laughs> I, of course the temptation is to play. All of Elvin's right, yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, to show him how much I know, how much right. I love him. Yeah. But I I don't know what I did. I can't remember what I played, yeah. you know, honestly. Um, because that's not as what as 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 important as what happened later. So mm. um later that night during that set, before Betty comes up, the band is playing, Ralph Peterson walks in. Ralph sees me across the 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 way, and um after we get off stage, we're taking a little break or something. He pulls me to the side. He said, hey, man, hey, listen, you know, the way you're playing, your left hand, your, your elbow's cl- too close to your torso. You know, pull it out. Watch this. And so he grabs my elbow, he turns my hand, and I see what it does to my grip. And from that point on, I think about it every moment I play. You know, he changed he changed my playing in that, that night. And so every time I would see Ralph, you know, I would tell him, I said, man, thank you for that lesson. Thank you for that wow. five minute lesson you gave me. Wow. And and unfortunately, I didn't see him enough. Yeah. I didn't see Ralph enough. Um, yeah. You know, I was in Virginia for another five or six years before I moved to New York mm-hmm. um, from that mo- that first night that I met him. And then once I moved to New York, I started working with Dave pretty heavily, Dave and Chris Potter pretty heavily. Mm-hmm. So I didn't cross paths with, with Ralph that often. Yeah. But um, when, whenever I saw him, I would thank him. Yeah. I would thank him for not just for that lesson, but just for for being him, for being such a great musician, such a great composer, and such yeah. a great teacher. Yeah, you know? yeah. Such a generous teacher. Yeah, he was so special. You know, I had a chance, um, Juilliard, when I was there, he, they bought him in to do a mm. few sort of rhythm section classes. And mm. you're right in that he can listen to a drummer, yes, and or, or any musician, but a drummer in particular, and he can listen to what is missing from your playing. Yes. And I remember him really talking to me about sound. He mm. was like, you know, you got to, you know, he was like, you got to get to the point where your sound uh, translates to the audience, you know, and mm. then he talked to me a lot about musicality. So mm. I love that you, you mentioned that because he, for as great of a player as he was, he was an even greater teacher. Yes, um, absolutely. So he was absolutely. amazing. I, I want to shift Nate and talk about, you know, I, I love how you, you reference all your great influences and all that, but you are now your own brand, Nate. I mean, you know, I got to give you your props. You are your oh, own man. brand. No, I mean, you know, hey, man, it, it's what it is. You're a great drummer, but you have ascended beyond just being one of the cats to you um, have so many people that love your playing. And so I want to get some tips from you for our audience before we go into even more specific things of how you built who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, if you were to, you know, if, if, if two, uh, two or three drummers came to you and said, hey, Nate, what are three recording tips? What are mm. three tips to playing live? You know, um, for Nate Smith, what, mm. what, what, what would that be? Man, I've learned so much, man. Look, starting with recording, okay. um, you know, I've moved to Nashville. I live in Nashville what? now. Yeah. I've, I'm in that. Oh, you making serious money now, Jack? Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> see, see. First of all, I only know a few people who've done that. Keith, Keith yep. Carlock, yep. who's another brand. You and there's a few other cats down there. You in yep. Nashville now, Nate? I'm in Nashville, brother. I'm in Nashville. I, I moved. Um, it's been a year. It's been a year. Um, you know, Whoa. man. You know, 2020 was the year of the pivot, man. COVID changed hey, the whole sh- game. Everybody, it was an exodus. It was an exodus. Why, you why, know? Na- why Nashville, Nate? So I had worked in Nashville a couple times pre-COVID. I'd done some recording pop and country yeah. dates, you know. And, um, you know, when the, when the road shut down, you know, the studio was the lifeline. The studio was the only thing that was going to keep me um, together, you know. And uh, I was like, okay, well, you know, I, it, it might be time for that pivot. I knew, number one, I knew I needed to get out of my apartment. I've been in my place for 13 years. And if you've lived in a New York apartment, 
you know when it's time to go, it's time You're to go. You're sick of it. You're sick of it, bro. You're sick of it. Yeah. Um, and then I also knew that for the cost of living, when I did the math, you know, I just wasn't going to get the space mm -hmm. that I was going to get here for the money in New York, you know. Um, and it's no shade to New York at all, but, but you know, I, it was time for me to spread out a little bit. So that's, that's why I made the move. And, and thank goodness, man, knock on wood, you know, mm -hmm. um, I landed on my feet and I started working pretty soon after I got here, you know. Um, but speaking to the recording piece, I will say this, um, you know, when you're playing parts for a record, mm -hmm. it's the same thing, man. It's like the idea that you're playing, whether you're playing for 100 people or mm -hmm. 10,000, it's the same thing. You're playing for a record that will either be heard by a few thousand people or a mm -hmm. few million people, mm -hmm. you know? And so everything you do, be as intentional as you can mm -hmm. um, with the parts you choose. Follow direction mm -hmm. from producers, songwriters, because you're there in service of the record, mm -hmm. you know? You're there in service of the part. I love that. And, and don't underestimate how much sound you can get out of playing soft. I will say this. Mm -hmm. That is another thing I've learned, man. Really soft playing, and I'm so grateful for, you know, jazz and the language mm -hmm. that I learned playing jazz and mm -hmm. continue to learn playing jazz because that has given me an enormous dynamic range mm -hmm. that I can bring to the studio. Right. Sometimes, man, you'll, you'll go in and you'll play really hard and you'll think, oh, that's it. And, and you'll listen back and say, hey, let me get one more take. And you'll play it at 80% less volume mm -hmm. and you'll hear an entirely different record. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? You'll hear an entirely different record. The, the, the idea of bringing listeners into the speakers as opposed mm -hmm. to pushing them away, you know? Mm -hmm. And so much of that is, is about the drums. Oh, I lost your video, bro. Um, but at any rate, um, oh, you're back. I think I lost you again. Um, anyway, speaking to, uh, to recording, I can say that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, I can say that for sure. Um, you know, in terms of, of playing live or, or um, you know, playing in different environments, um, man, I, I, I keep going back to this idea of doing your homework, you know, do your homework on every gig mm -hmm. that you take. Yeah. If you say yeah. yes, do your homework. Great. You know, yeah. that's the thing. If you don't feel like doing your homework, don't say yes. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's pretty simple, you know. That's an um, art too. <laughs> there's an art. Oh man, that's an art. That's an yeah. art. Um, and the, the the other thing I would just say to any artist who is or drummer particularly who is looking to sort of build a brand or build a sound, let your peers shape that sound too. Whoa. You know? So, like, you know, in 2011, um, the Dave Holland Quintet kind of stopped touring. Chris Potter Underground kind of stopped touring and I was left kind of in New York. You know? So you had a moment like that too, where oh. stuff dried up. Wow. Oh my gosh. Man, wow. from I'd say honestly, brother, from 2011 to 2014 wow. was a, a, a sort of a page in my career that was a really, I mean, it was it was kind of empty. There wasn't much happening, you know, in terms of a steady Whoa, game. Nate. Yeah. It was slow, brother, and it was scary too. Because, you know, I had had this one gig for so long. Everyone assumed I was busy. You know, cats assume, oh, he's working with, with Dave or he's working with Chris. You know, he's not available. I'm not going to call him. So, um, but one of the things that I did learn during that time is that the musicians who did call me, I started to notice what they were calling me for, hmm. you know. So during that time, I met Near Felder. I met Somi. Mm. I played with Robbie Coltrane. I played with Leonel Lueke. Jose James, which turned into a long, right. you know, relationship. Um, and one of the things that I noticed um, in all of those situations was there was this, all of those gigs with, even with the, even Ravi's gig in, in certain contexts, all of those gigs, there was an intersection of style in those gigs. Okay. You know, Somi's gig requires you to play yeah. some stuff that's, more, you know, some yeah. stuff that's the more like sort of color and ambient, yeah. and then more some stuff that's like you're playing sort of high life grooves and you right, know, right. you're playing Afrobeat stuff. It, it right. calls on different things, you right. know, but the range is what that period gave me. You know, wow. it gave me that range because I was showing up to play my best for people, right. trying to play my best for people, 
and wanting to know what was the thing that all those people were calling me for, you know? So, so, so Nate, I'm really glad you spoke about this sort of um, what I'll call is not a dead period, but kind of a revamp period. Yeah. I had the same thing when I left McBride's band and yeah. I had it, it same, you know, with Kurt, where it was kind of like you're you you know you're headed somewhere yes but you don't quite know where you're headed but you know that you want more and i also know for you when you came out of that period you really emerged as not only just this great groove drummer but also a great band leader mm. can you talk about can, you know as much as you want to share can you take us behind the because i know you're a strategist brother i also know <laughs> people that are friends of yours you know yeah. <laughs> keith witty and i are very close yeah. and yeah and i i hear you're a mad scientist so t take us a little bit behind the door of you have this dark period yeah and you are like all right i want to create a band i want to yes. call it kinfolk yeah i want these people to be in the band i yeah. want to be a studio cat because you know i'm into visualization and i know you're you are too so yeah. can you take us into where most people are right now where they're like trying to shift they're trying to go to the next level like what did nate smith do to mm. go from nate smith with dave holland and and it's really just a cat that could have kind of survived on your resume to now you know where you are which is a completely different Place. Yeah, man, that's that was a crucial moment. Like okay. the the decision to do it, it came from a couple things. Learning from master band leaders too, and wow. again, got to point back to Betty, Dave, and also my brother Chris, Chris Potter. I got to give him yeah. some props too. Yeah. Um, but with Dave, the thing I learned about Dave, Dave was always working on multiple projects. Wow. He always had irons in the fire. Okay. Right. When he was on tour with the tent, he was writing parts for the big band. When the big band was out, he was getting ready to do a sideman project with, you know, Herbie or, or whoever, you know. And when that was finished, he had another group. He had the great overtone group with um, wow. Jason and Chris and, you know, and Eric. And then he had another group, uh, the sextet with the late Mulgrew, you know, oh. Mulgrew Miller. You know what I'm saying? He was like second father to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Brother, yeah. I, and that's that's another cat man. I did not have a chance to play with Mulgrew. I I, oh, I but I love him. I love yeah. him so much. And yeah. I'm so grateful for all the music he left, you know. Yeah. Um but speaking to this idea of building something. Right. Um you know, when the phone stops ringing and people aren't calling you for stuff, it's time to look in and say, "Okay, well, wow. You know what? Number one, I can't worry so much about the phone not ringing. What am I going to do with this time? Wow. You know, what am I going to do with it? Like, how am I going to spend it? Am I going to spend it looking at my phone, <laughs> wait, waiting for it to ring? Like, oh, that's oh, real. No. Or am I going to spend it building something? You know, okay. I might as well make something. Okay. You know, so that was that was 2000. I think it was 2013 when I finally made the decision to take the plunge, create Kenfolk, announce kinfolk um play a gig with the band um and um actually before that my first band leader gig was actually 2011 really? and it was with, yeah it was with uh jaleel <laughs> uh fema efron near felder and i think aaron parks was on that gig it was okay. at the 55 bar that was my very first new york band leader gig and you know it wow. was the same instrumentation as kinfolk without a vocalist um, but it was like the, the beginning of my idea of, okay, so what happens when it's my name on the ticket? Wow. You know? mm -hmm. um, so okay. that was the thing, man. And, and, and so, you know, the idea of kinfolk came from this, another conversation I had with Dave in which he said, you know, musicians find each other. You're going to find your tribe out here. Oh, I love that. You know, wow. isn't, isn't that beautiful? He was like, yeah, man, musicians find each other. I really believe that he, he used to tell me. And so, yeah, the, you know, I, you know, met Jaleel through yeah. Dave. Wow. I met FEMA through Chris. Right. Um, Jeremy Most, who who was on the first Ken Folk yeah, record. Yeah, I know Most. You yeah. know Most? Yeah. I mean, Most was, you know, I had known him sort of as this, like, studio guy. And he's an ingenious record producer. Oh, really? Um, yes. Oh, man. Whoa. All of Emily King's records. Man. What? Bruh. Jay Most. Jay Most is that dude. Wow. Jay Most had, I mean, I know I get on these tangents, bro. I, I, I promise I, I'm going to No, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Bruh, Jay Most had a, he had a demo, this legendary like five track demo. This is back in the MySpace days. Mm -hmm. He had, man, these five songs, cats were passing this shit around. It was like, yo, who is this? The tracks, the, the, the harmony, the songs, it was just incredible. But wow. I just loved his skill as an arranger and also the fact that he was such a great rhythm guitarist too. Interesting. You know? 
And also on the first record was the great Chris Bowers, who I met through Jose. Oh, yeah. Wow. You know? So that was the beginning of the Kenfolk family. And then, of course, Ama What? Shout out to Ama. Yeah, yeah. Who, um, who joined as, like, the voice of the band, you know? Okay. Um, so, you know, me doing it was less about, like, you know, a long-term strategy as much and more about wanting to build something and hoping that the next steps would appear once I started, you know? So I have to ask, um, Nate, where did you go from again? I'm going to keep hammering this question home till you answer it. Okay. To you being what you were to all of a sudden, Nate, I, I, I remember looking on, I don't, I think it may have been Instagram. All of a sudden, Bootsy Collins was saying you're the funkiest drummer he's ever heard, or whatever. Right, and right, I rem- right. and I remember like with, when you started playing with Jose. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, then you know Brittany Howard. Like, did you actively start? Because you remind me so much of you know Steve Jordan, who's like a mentor. You yeah. know, you you sound so much like Steve, but then there's another kind of thing to your groove. So mm-hmm. so man, did you just start shedding groove? Because I mean, I know you probably could always play it, but like, where did it go from? You could just you you know all of us can play a little groove. Tell like mm-hmm. you're the groove guy. Mm. Was that was that a conscious thing or was it that you know something just went viral? Like like what like how did that happen for for you? It was it was never a conscious. I never said I'm gonna shed groove. It was really okay. it was I was in different contexts that called on that language. Ah you know? okay. Um, from Dave Hollins, we were playing a lot of groove in that band. Right. I also have to talk about Chris Potter Underground too, ah. because you know. My time with Jose, it definitely increased my visibility because right. of, you know, sharing the videos on socials. Yeah, yeah. But the actual language that I developed, a lot of that incubated while I was playing with Chris. Because that band is, is a funk fusion band, okay. you know? And so, and it, and it called on a lot of vocabulary okay. that could, could help to sort of shift the sound of the ensemble, you okay. know? Okay. So... Any of those Chris Potter Underground records, the first one, okay. um, the live one, the first one is with Wayne Krantz on guitar. The live the, from the Village Vanguard one, uh, Follow the Red Line, that's the one that was like the core band with okay. Adam Rogers, Craig Taborn, okay. Chris, and myself. You know, um, a lot of my groove language, I really kind of was e- extending it on those mm-hmm. records. Okay, you know? and um, and then of course my time with Jose, my, my time playing with Nier Felder. Yeah, okay. Um, a lot of that's you know, his his music calls on a lot of that language too. Okay. So it 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 kind of wasn't it didn't come out of nowhere. It okay. just it, it was something that kind of had been in always in my playing, right? But the the musical situations called on more of it so that more people heard it, you know. Wow, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So I, I always wanted to ask this. Do you ever feel like like okay you're you're being known for this being this great groove drummer but there's all this other stuff you do like have you ever had this thought of like damn like y'all a little bit late to the party like or <laughs> i had to play a funk groove for y'all to know you know because i because to be honest nate i have to say like i feel that way about your playing like i'm glad you're getting all the dap i love it but i'm like this dude been playing his butt off for like 20 years so like do you you know do you ever feel like damn bootsy had to hear me just play a repetitive four bar pattern as opposed to i've been playing like superimposed right you know because i feel that way because everybody's like oh nate smith like you know the groove i'm like no nate smith is a brilliant drummer and i'm glad that he's getting his dap but what he's getting his dap for to me is like a, a a mere percentage of what you're actually great at like do you even feel that or you you're just probably grateful for whatever i i i am grateful um I am grateful for all the opportunities to play. And, you know, I know, um, you know, that all of it works together. Hmm. You know, all of it works together. Hmm. You know, I think about Brittany Howard and my collaboration with her. Hmm. And I think about one of the records on her album, this Hmm. this song called 13th Century Metal. Hmm. That's on her record. And that entire composition is a three and a half minute improvisation with me and Robert, Robert Glasper. Whoa. Whoa. Robert, he, Robert walked into the synth room and he just started playing this thing on these two synths, right? Wow. And I started playing with him and we did this for four and a half minutes, right? Wow. Now, all the music that I've played, Dave and Chris and Betty, all that led me to that moment. Wow. To be able to be open to playing with Robert to be able to improvise with him, to, to kind of speak a similar language with him, we could meet in that place. Mm-hmm. So I feel like all of it really works together. So, okay. you know, I, you know, I, you know, I see the, the fearless flyers and they got the, you know, the, 
Madison Square Garden video. And man, that stuff is fun. I'm not, you know, but I know that inside of my playing, inside of all those choices I make, you know, all of this lineage is in it. All of it's in it. All of it has led to this, this moment. So the way I play ghost notes, the way I play hi-hat, the way I play dynamics, even if I'm playing kick snare hat, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of Elvin. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm thinking of Bernard Purdy. I'm thinking of Will Calhoun, who was thinking of Elvin. You know, Woo. it's it's all connected. It's all connected. So I, I've never thought of it as, you know, this is one thing and this is another. It's like, no, it, it kind of all works together Man. in the play. You know, um, that's that's at least my my um, approach to it, you know. No, that makes sense. Um, I have a couple more questions before I let you go. Um, you know, I have a whole thing I do here with with kids. And, and uh, one of my kids is the like such a big fan of yours, bro. Uh, on, his name is Andre Liggins. He and his father. I literally saw them yesterday. And they were like, you're going to be talking to, to Nate. And uh, Ken, they said Ken Folk is about to have a soulful conversations. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so anyway, so they, they had some uh, questions for you. And okay. uh, then, of course, I want to dive into love with because I'm like, all right, bro, I see. I yep. see you over there switching. Yep. But um, but Andre's question was is two part. One is outside of your family. Where do you find inspiration for your songs? Mm. Um, one of the biggest inspirations is there's always a story in a song and I don't write lyrics, you know, I, I oh, used wow. to try to write lyrics, but I, you know, I gave up on that, yeah, but I try to... everything, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I try, um, to sort of sum up a feeling in a song, um, or in a composition, even if the composition starts as a four chord pattern on piano. You know, um, but inspiration for songs for this particular my, for my newest record. One of the things I'm really trying to do is make this music a reflection of the music I heard as a teenager wow. that made me want to make music professionally. Wow. So there are going to be elements of rock, living color. There are going to be elements of hip hop. There are going to okay. be elements of all. This other, but it's all kind of coming through this lens that okay. I, I saw the world with and, and this this mind that I heard the, the world through, okay. you know. Um so that's 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 where the most recent music is is inspired. Beautiful. And the other one was uh which I'm gonna end the podcast once you know we get through a couple other questions with this song. Um he says where did the inspiration for skip step uh come from? Oh man. Um so that pattern um that was something that I was humming for about a week straight. And I remember I was in an airport and I was, I was, it was an early one of those early mornings and I had my little voice memo and I just hummed that pattern. And I hummed it and then I just sat on it for like a year. I didn't know what to do Whoa. with it. I didn't know what to do with it. So finally I, I pulled it up and I put it in Pro Tools and I looped it. And I just like played along with it. And then the bass, it all started with that particular loop though, that, that particular dude, the keyboard part that's in the, in the record. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the, you know, the inspiration for it, I kind of was going for this. What would have happened if mm -hmm. Maurice White produced a record right. with Dave Holland, Lynn Elowecki, <laughs> Chris uh, Bowers. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what would that record sound like? <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> you know? right. So that right. was that was my beginning. Maurice yeah. White is, you know, you know, he's to me, he's he's one of the greatest musicians who yeah. has ever lived. Yeah, no, he's yeah. unbelievable. No, yeah. man, so that's cool. And it's funny you talk about the whole voice memo thing because um that's how I also record my ideas as well. Yes. Um so I, yeah. I love to hear that somebody else is like, you know, in the airport singing stuff. Uh Benny Banak has some atrocious <laughs> recordings of me, you know, at three in the morning, uh singing. Um yeah. so anyway, I'm glad to hear that. The the other question I was gonna ask you, man, can you tell me about the Ludwig drums switch? I was really shocked to hear um, I mean, they're great drums, but I was shocked to see you, someone so modern, mm. someone, mm. Uh, you know, because as you, I think not Kareem, I think yeah. Questlove. Yeah. So, you know, um, and then, you know, what do you have going on now? So it'd be interesting that, you know, just what led you to them? Well, man, I'll tell you, Ludwig is my first endorsement. What? I, I did not have a drum endorsement. Are you before, kidding me? I did not. I did not. No. My first gear endorsement was Zildjian. Uh-huh. Um, and then I was with Vader for a long time after yeah. that. 
Um, and it would be years, yeah. but brother. I, you know, we'll have to talk about this offline. Yeah, but of course, <laughs> I do. I just want to just give a little um, shout out to a number of drum companies uh-huh. who were not interested in the kid. Oh, we don't even have to talk about that because they I were went not through interested. that, brother. Yep. It was 2012, mm-hmm. and I was about to do this pop tour with a, a singer songwriter, Joe Jackson. Mm-hmm. I, I did a tour with him, and I was looking for an endorsement for you know t- t- drums on the road. I was going you know, every night. We were playing some big halls, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I reached out to every manufacturer except Ludwig, Ludwig yeah. actually, yeah, and universally rejected. Mm-hmm. You know, so Ludwig um, happened because. Um, Ulysses Salazar became their artist. Is that his name? Yes. (laughs) Yes. My brother Uli. Wow. My brother Uli Salazar. And Uli saw my videos on my socials, saw this this growing social presence, and um, he reached out. And so I was in Chicago doing a show, went to the the drum shop, played a bunch of stuff, loved what I heard. Mm -hmm. My first drum ever was a Ludwig Acrylite. Wow. And um, I still have that drum, still play it. So yeah, it, it kind of felt natural once we met. Okay. Well, well, you know, it's interesting, man, because uh, you know, I'm not gonna throw no shade on on people, but I feel like the jazz drummers out here that have been playing their butt off, doing great things, I feel like we get uh I won't say shunned, but we don't get the love that I think we should get from I agree. the drum companies. I mean, and and you know, man, I could do a roll call. Um, as well and not even just the drum companies that won't sign you but the ones that will sign but then won't give you the dap you know right um and then all of a sudden now everybody's you know calling and stuff like that but i but i do think it's a double-edged sword in that it's a true testament to play the music play the music Mm. at the highest level and all the stuff that's meant to come to you will come to you and i was thinking about this the other day when i was looking in my studio as i'm sure you have a space with a bunch of ludwig stuff and i was looking at my space with a bunch of tama stuff and i was just like you know i actually need this stuff now when i wanted it i really didn't need it then you know what i mean like you're at a place where you're doing all these sessions so so you actually have it when you need it which is even a spiritual principle you know so yeah i think it's you know what's meant is is meant what's meant is meant and it'll it'll come it'll come so Nate, tell us what do you have going on now? You're in Nashville, which I'm I didn't even know about. Um, what do you want the world to know about Nate Smith uh, today? You know, uh, I the the next Ken Folk record is coming very soon. Yes, uh, September seventeenth, uh, Ken uh-huh. Folk two edition uh-huh. record. Shout out to uh, Dave Stapleton. Nice. Um, he's been doing great work, getting people excited about the record. Yeah. Um, I'll be back on the road with Brittany Howard. Uh, this fall, we're going to start up. Uh, I think our first show is actually coming up in about a week. We're going to be at Lollapalooza okay. in Chicago. She's doing that festival. Excuse me, sir. Bruh. You know, <laughs> she, she's, she's a rock star, brother. You know, what I mean? you know I'm just, you, I'm just, I'm catching I, the overspray. <laughs> I just like how you said that real casually, like like it was the Green Mill or something. You, <laughs> you're like, yeah, we're just we're playing Lollapalooza. Oh, okay. <laughs> brother, I'm I'm just following the thread. I'm just I'm just on the bus. Yeah, I'm just on the bus. Um, cool. And yeah, and and Ken Folk's gonna play some shows this okay. fall. We've got a couple shows booked for November. Um, okay. A little north northeast swing, yeah. and some stuff in February next year in May. So you know, m- much more stuff to come. Much cool. more stuff to come. And, and I, I have to say, man, I love also seeing you on all the drum magazines now, man, and seeing you. You know, uh, I think you did. Was it Pasic last year? Yeah. Or, or year did. before last? Year before. Year before. Yeah. 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 So I'm loving that the world is is the drumming world is giving you the love because again that's another community that you know if y'all are listening modern drummer yes. drum magazine yes you know rhythm magazine yes, yes. Man, come 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 over to the jazz side because I think that so many of those drummers that have been on the cover you know 20 times a lot of their inspirations are the great jazz drummers absolutely so so I love seeing that um, before I close out Nate can you tell me what is the best piece of advice. Um, that you've ever received, at, be it musical, be it life, but that has helped you in your musical career? Oh, man, I'll give you two. Betty okay. Carter, the last time I saw her alive, hmm. she said to me, she said, don't waste time. Whoa. Don't waste time. This is your music. You know, don't waste your time. I, I, and the fact that she died two months after I heard her say that. Wow. You know, that left, that reverberated in my mind. Wow. Um, second thing, I got to shout out my father. Wow. Um, and you know, he's been gone for six years now, wow. but 
you know, he used to tell me, when in doubt, just wait. When in doubt, just wait. And that, brother, that governs everything. Wow. You, you want to play this thing? You want to go for this thing? But you're not sure? Okay, wait. Okay, now. You know? That was the, that's, I, I can't tell you how many times I think of both of those pieces of advice in, in wow. so many parts of my life, you know? Wow. Well, Nate, I just want to thank you. I know you're an incredibly busy brother. And uh, thank you to Chris as well for, for allowing me to get you on the show, man. Oh, um, man. My pleasure, you. man. I'm so I'm so proud of everything you're doing, brother. Congratulations on the books. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations man. on the festival. Thank you, man. Man, that's huge. That's <laughs> huge, brother. Hey, man. Well, you know, like we talked about when the phone is not ringing, you, you know, after a while, I was like, actually, I want to be the cat that makes some other people phone <laughs> ring. So absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, man. So I'm going to close out, um, Nate, thank you. I'm going to close out actually with an incredible composition by Nate Smith. I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a teaser because y'all need to go and support, get all the Kinfolk records, and also all these other records that he mentioned with Chris Potter, yes. uh, Underground, Dave Holland, um, and all this other uh, great stuff. I think you're on a few Somi. Is it one Somi record? Or I'm, on, I'm, I'm on two of them. The one that's about to come out, I think I'm on it, um, the, the Miriam Makiba Project. And oh, also, nice. Yeah, the uh, Petite Afrique. I'm playing on, on most of that record. I was actually hanging out at Steve's spot. I think you had just gone to his place and recorded stuff, and he let yeah. me hear some of the roughs, and it was, yeah. man, so groovy. So yeah, support man. Nate and everything he's doing. Follow him if you're not following him already, and uh, thank y'all for being here. So next week we have Jonathan Blake Jr., and uh, we're excited about that, but we're going to end on an incredible note and uh, just get a touch of skip step. So check this out. This is the drummer's perspective with Ulysses Owens Jr. in open studio. And I appreciate y'all. See you next Wednesday. All right, everybody, thank you so much. I appreciate you for checking out the show. See you next Wednesday. Peace out.